I think Fort St. John is a working community. Uh, we're resource driven. Typically everyone here is here to earn a living and raise a family. When I first heard of it, I had to Google what a Fort St. John was or where it was. Having arrived, it's so similar to other communities that I've worked in. I don't find that a community is really the structures. I find it's the people that are within the, the community that really make it something that's great. Everyone gets involved because they need to get involved. No one else is doing this for you. You need to step up and that's been our experience through the sports organization, the arts and, and that sort of thing. It's an interesting community, like the population is around 25,000 kind of people. It's happy with the oil and gas kind of industries. It's a very diverse community. For the most part, good employment, good money, and that leads people to party hard sometimes. And one of those things is, is uh, fentanyl or heroin. And, um, the money is there, so they have the ability to carry on with it. The opioid crisis presents itself in many different ways, and some ways might not be as evident as others, but it's here and it's happening, and it has been happening for a long time. While it's a lovely place for young families, for business, it is also a place that needs attention, especially concerning addiction, mental health, and poverty. We have seen it affect all kinds of people within our community. People are not sectoralized with this. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. I think the opioid crisis has touched people's lives across the entire community in Fort St. John. number of times I've seen people show up with a body in the back seat of their car or a taxi cab show up and someone has overdosed and the body starts to change colors. I've seen blue people, I've seen purple people. Um, basically they stop breathing. My personal association is I've known a lot of working guys that are professional, hardworking family guys that are doing what I did, keeping secrets and using, and some of them make it and some of them don't. What's dangerous with especially the introduction of fentanyl is that you don't know which drugs have it or which drugs don't. So I remember a point years ago where you know you would stay away from heroin because that was pretty dangerous and now we're having to educate that uh, to our users for every drug. And they're actually educating us because they're usually on the front lines of what's coming into the community. Fort St. John has the second highest burden of opioid overdose related deaths in the Northern BC next to Prince George. So it has a significant burden. In 2018, we have about 10 people died uh, from the opioid overdose deaths. For each overdose related death, there's a 10, at least 10 like emergency visit relate to that. But the, that opioid overdose death is kind of tip of the iceberg. There's people dying from the overdose, the people are having the overdose. Some of them might come to the hospital. Many of them don't come to the hospitals. Then there are people with a substance use issues and mental health issues. And there are generally kind of vulnerable population in the communities. There's no question that the, the opioid crisis is, um, is a crisis in British Columbia. So it really worries me on a, from a societal perspective that people of any age who are trying something for whatever reason could be their very last time. I think part of the education also needs to be around just the pure science and the dangers that didn't exist before and that do now. The thing with addiction is you're just one person trying to either kill your pain or chase your addiction, whatever, however that's working out. And it never, it never worked. It never worked. He would come home and I know he was high and he would say, no, he wasn't. The lies followed and then the strangers started showing up at the door and lack of money because I would go to the bank and money wasn't there when it should have been. 
um, always being afraid that I would be homeless, uh, hungry, even to the point where I feared that my front door was going to get kicked in because he owed. I can't help but think how much pain I caused her just by living with her in my addiction. And she must have felt so alone. One thing we're doing is trying to, trying to demystify the, um, the scary parts of addiction and just try to teach the community it can happen to anyone. It is happening to everyone. So as a community, we can actually come alongside, better educate ourselves and then better educate our children about how to respond. One of the key things you want to kind of check with the overdose is that uh, it looks like when you just look from the outside without actually closely inspecting that, it looks like the person is kind of getting sleepy and not very responsive. And uh, the dangerous thing going on and what kills people from the overdose is the, the depression of the respiratory systems. Or you're kind of lying down and you can actually choke on yourself or kind of vomiting choke on yourself, but it's a depression of respiratory system. Come on, Dad. Dad! I think one of the big responses Northern Health has taken towards the opiate crisis is ensuring everyone has access to free naloxone. That's a big one. So naloxone helps prevent overdose. Uh, if someone's overdosing, it's an injection you can give someone. Um, that stops the opiates from causing overdose. And to get them, you just come to the ER. The ICMT office is right at the entrance to the ER, so we work to make it completely anonymous and really streamline, just it's easy to get. You come knock on the ER uh, door and just ask for it. No questions asked, you get it. Once he went to treatment, I saw his little light again and it made it easier, and he's been doing his very best. So out, out of all the promises that I have made, the one that I promised her is that she would not die alone. That's the one thing I'm gonna try my very best to make sure it happens for sure. I've broken many, many promises, too many. Addiction doesn't discriminate between who it chooses to impact in our community. And shame shouldn't be something that keeps a person away from asking for help. If help isn't readily available, then there's so many people in our community that'll help you find what you need. I think it's totally normal for young people to want to have fun and to experiment, to try different things. What really concerns me about the current opioid crisis is that, you know, your first time can be your last time in terms of trying uh, some of these chemicals or pills out there. You may be convinced that it's totally safe. You could be with someone that you completely trust and they may not even know the origin of some of these chemicals. And uh, I would just encourage you and your friends to be cautious, to support each other, and really think twice uh, before experimenting with, with these drugs. It's like playing Russian roulette with a six-shooter gun with five bullets. Uh, to me, I don't think there's a riskier thing you could do in life. I have some statistics here from First Nations Health Authority that I received this morning about last year. In 2018, 191 First Nations men and women died of an overdose in British Columbia, a 20% increase from 2017. First Nations overdose deaths are rising both in number and as proportion of the overall population, despite the temporary emergency measures rolled out this far. In 2018, First Nations accounted for 13% of overdose deaths, which is up from 11% the previous year. First Nations are dying at a rate of 4.2 times higher than the rest of the population. That's up from a rate of 3.4 in 2017. And the last one I'd like to share is First Nations women are dying at a much higher rate than non-First Nations women. And this accounts for a large proportion of the overall disparity in death rates. There are people willing to listen. There are people willing to help you get what you need. Um, Please don't let 
shame, guilt, or embarrassment hide you from the fact that we're playing with lives. Lives are, are on the line. People are dying from this uh, overdose epidemic and, and we can prevent some of that. So I would just encourage you, personally as a father, as a friend, and as a leader in the social community here in Fort St. John, to ask for help. There is so much help in Fort St. John. I think the big thing is just submitting to the process, trusting that people are here to help, and knowing that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Just need to have a little faith and, and submit a bit. If I could change anything about this crisis at all, um, it would actually be, it would come from ordinary men and women. People just like you and I, okay? People who prepared to break down barriers, break down stigmas, and make a difference. Make a difference by caring. And only you and I can do that. As soon as you understand that there is hope and that there are people out there that are more than happy and willing to help you get your life back, believe it, your life is worth saving. Fort St. John may be small, but it is really a tight little town. There are a lot of people with very big hearts. You might have to look a little bit to find that avenue, to find that glimmer. But once you see it, it is bright, it is shiny, and it is there. You can get your life back. Just don't give up on your life. Fight for your life.